iterations, uh, in process iterations, and it's going to be those which are going to be timed, and that's, that's going to constitute the results of our benchmarks. Now, having done that, we can make what's called a run sequence plot. A run sequence plot has on the x-axis the in process iteration number, and on the y-axis the corresponding iteration times. Now, because we have a just-in-time compiler, we don't expect to see constant performance over time. Perhaps we'd expect to see something more like this. In other words, there are uh, distinct phases through which the VM um, travels through as it executes the benchmark. So the phases are, in the beginning, the VM may be in its profiling interpreter mode. Here we are interpreting slowly the user's program, but also trying to figure out which parts of the code are frequently executed, which types we uh, commonly encounter, etc. And that information is then fed into the next phase, which is the compilation phase. And then finally, we should end up in the steady state of peak performance. And this is the bit that um, most people are interested in measuring. Now you're looking at that plot and you're thinking, there's way too many straight lines there. It doesn't look like that in real life, and you're absolutely right. We'd actually expect perhaps to see something more like this. So there are a few differences here. Firstly, there's a quite a lot of noise on this plot. The reason that there is noise is because there are lots of non-deterministic uh, parts involved in benchmarking. So there is the operating system, there is the hardware, there's all kinds of things which are non-deterministic. And for that reason, we see random noise, basically. The other thing that I'm showing on this plot, plot is that the compilation doesn't necessarily all have to happen at once. So there could be two or more compilation um, tiers, if you like. And then finally, you'll notice this spike here. That's been strategically placed to show that you may expect to see spikes if you have a garbage collector, especially one which is, um, if it's a, a stop the world garbage collector. Now, when people benchmark, typically what they are interested in measuring is this part here, so the steady state of peak performance. Uh, this talk is not about that. This talk is about this interval here, which is called the warm-up phase. Now, why should we be so interested in the warm-up phase? Well, firstly, users really don't like bad warm-up, even if they don't know it. To them, bad warm-up is a program which is behaving badly, or slowly, I should say. Um, secondly, VM warfers really dislike poor warm-up because it gets in the way of their bragging rights to say that their VM is faster than someone else's. So I'm arguing that warm-up is actually very important and that we should be measuring it. And for that reason, we, um, we devised an experiment as part of this research to measure exactly that. We want to know how long the warm-up phase is for modern language implementations containing just-in-time compilers. And our hypothesis throughout has been that if we use small and deterministic programs, then we should reach a state of steady peak performance. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to describe the design of the experiment, and then we'll move on and look at the results of the experiment after that. So firstly, which benchmarks should we be using? Well, we use the computer language benchmark games. Um, now, usually these are considered uh, a bad set of benchmarks because they're too small to be uh, real programs, really. But for us, uh, this ties in nicely with our hypothesis, which is that small and deterministic programs should reach a steady state of peak performance. So excellent. Um, secondly, how long should we run these things? Well, how long do you guys normally run your benchmarks? Uh, I don't know, 30 or 50 times? We went for way more. We decided to use 2,000 in-process iterations, and then we decided to repeat that 30 times. And that gives us a huge amount of data to be working with. Next up, which VMs? Um, so these are all um, current VMs, and these were the current versions at the time of writing, um, apart from GCC. So we have Graal, HHVM, JRuby, Truffle, which is now uh, called Truffle Ruby, I think, uh, Hotspot, LuaJet, PyPy, and V8. Now, GCC is the elephant in the room there. This exists in our experiment for two reasons. Firstly, it acts as a kind of a baseline uh, because it doesn't contain a, uh, a just-in-time compiler. But also, it's, um, that version of GCC is used to compile all of the above VMs, thus eliminating versions of GCC as a confounding variable. Uh, next up are machines, two Linux machines, one OpenBSD machine. Of course, we went into the BIOS, turned off Turbo Boost and hyperthreading because those are two are confounding variables as far as we're concerned. And then how should we actually run our benchmarks? Well, we could have used a very simple benchmarking loop, but we actually went all out and ran a custom harness, which we call CRUN. The idea behind CRUN is that it controls as many uh, of the confounding variables uh, as is humanly possible, basically. So to give you an idea of the kind of lengths we went to, CRUN minimizes I.O., it sets uh, memory limits, it drops privileges to a freshly made user account for each process execution, it reboots the system prior to each process execution, it checks the D message buffer for anything which could indicate that something may have gone wrong. Um, it checks the temperature before each process execution. And the list goes on. And this is just a partial list. Um, what I'm trying to get across here is that we really, really tried very hard 
to measure only the um, characteristics of the benchmark running on the VM and nothing outside. Okay, so once we've collected our data, what we then decided we would do is that we would classify automatically all of our process executions to say um, how they warmed up, whether they warmed up in a, in a good fashion, whether they remained flat, for example. Um, so what we do is we use a method called change points analysis. Um, now, I'll give you a quick 101 of how that works. We take our process executions data. We then identify outliers and ignore them. We then identify change points. Now, on our plots, change points are going to be these vertically dashed red lines. Um, and then between each change point, we have what's called a change point segment. Now, a change point segment is a, uh, a collection of consecutive in-process iterations whose um, mean and variance were very similar. In other words, we're picking apart all of the phases that I was talking about earlier in, uh, from our data. And using these segments, we can then automatically say whether a, warm, uh, whether a uh, process execution warmed up in, um, in a good manner, basically. So the rules for uh, our classifications, once we've got the segments, are if all of the segments are equivalent, we say the process execution is flat. Now, you'll notice the, the use of the word equivalent there. So there is a, um, there is a tolerance involved here. Um, if we're very close, if two uh, segment means are very close, uh, then we will consider them to be the same segment. If, however, the length, sorry, if the length of the final set of equivalent segments are longer than 500 iterations and they are the fastest segments, then we say that the process execution has warmed up. If they're not the fastest segments, then it's slowed down. And the only other case is that the, the benchmark did not stabilize. In other words, there was a change point in the last 500 iterations of those 2,000 in-process iterations. Okay, so that's the design of the experiment out of the way. Now we're going to look at results. And this is going to come in two phases. First, we'll just look at some plots. And then after that, we're going to look at some numbers. So firstly, um, let's start with the things that, uh, that behaved as we might expect. Many process executions were classified as flat. You can see in the top right-hand corner of each plot the classification. Um, this is fairly uninteresting, actually. There's just one segment and one outlier. This is absolutely fine. This is, this is great. Uh, the next classification that we saw was warm-up. This is faster running on VA on a Linux machine. Um, there is, although there is a very long warm-up phase here, about 800 iterations, um, the, the, nonetheless, the process execution does warm up, and that's absolutely fine. Um, here's another example. This one warms up much quicker, but has more outliers. So not all process executions behaved as we might expect. And I guess you could see that coming. So here is an example of a benchmark slowing down. This is Richards running on hotspot on a Linux machine. What we see here is an initial warm-up. So if you look at the, the, what this is showing here, is this is a zoomed-in version of the first, first few iterations. We have an initial warm-up. But then after 200 iterations, we slow down by about 10%. Um, this is the polar opposite of what a just-in-time compiler should do. Uh, it's also very worrying to me because this is the Richards benchmark, which is a very mature benchmark running on Hotspot, which is a very mature VM. Um, so what's happened there? This simply shouldn't happen. And here's another example. This is faster running on V8 on a Linux machine. Again, a very long um, uh, warm-up phase, but then the steady state is actually slower than all of the, the um, warm-up phase. So again, it simply shouldn't happen. Another thing we saw was uh, no steady state, which means that there was a change point in the last 500 iterations of the process execution. This is binary trees on V8 on a Linux machine. Um, the reason that it's classified um, no steady state is because of this change point here very late on in the process execution. Uh, again, um, shouldn't really happen. And finally, another thing we noticed was that there was a lot of inconsistency in the results. What you see here are two run sequence plots, one for, um, so they're both for binary trees, they're both for V8, and they're both on the same Linux machine, just repeated. The one on the left shows warm up, the one on the right shows slow down. What this tells us is that there is, um, if you repeat your experiment, you may not get the same results, which is kind of worrying. Okay, so that's enough staring at plots. What we're gonna do now is look at some numbers. Now, um, for each machine, we generated one big table like this. I don't expect you to be able to read that. It's a very small font. What I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in on just one section of the, plot, of the um, table. We'll look at this part here. So what we see here is the first column is showing the VMs. The next, shot, the next column is showing the classifications that we saw. 
the next column, steady iter hash, is showing the iteration number upon which we reached a steady state, if at all we reached a steady state. Uh, the next column is then just the corresponding time with that iteration number. And then the final column is the performance of the steady state, if at all we reach the steady state. So let's look at a couple of examples. The first row there is showing C running binary trees. This symbol here means that all 30 process iterations did not stabilize. Uh, and for that reason, you don't see anything in the remaining columns. Graal running binary trees has this symbol here, which means inconsistent in a bad way. Um, if you look then in the brackets, you see why it was inconsistent in a bad way. 27 process executions warmed up and three slowed down. And to take the most complicated we saw here, Luajit running on binary trees. Here, this was inconsistent in a bad way with 23 warm-ups, four slowdowns, two flats, and one no steady state. So that gives you an idea of the kind of thing that we're up against here, and we didn't expect it to be quite this way. Now, like I said, we had three of these tables, one for each machine. Um, we then wanted to crush that down into sort of like a takeaway, uh, a takeaway, some, you know, just some, some small statistics, basically. And that's what this table is here. Um, so we have the classifications in the first column and then the machines along the top. Now, let's start with the bottom of this table. Here we're counting the number of process executions which warmed up according to which classifications. And what, what we decided to do is look at the best case. The best case here is the OpenBSD machine where we see 86.1% of process executions warming up either with flat or warm up. Those are the good cases. So hmm, that's kind of okay, I suppose, um, but it doesn't take into account the inconsistency that we've noted earlier in the talk. So what the top part of the table is showing is the number of VM and benchmarking pairings which warm up in a good way. So in a good way, in this case, we're talking about they were either all flat or warm up, or they were consistent in a good way, which is a mix of flat or warm up. So in that, um, in that case, the best, the best case we saw was um, only 43.5% of VM benchmark pairings warming up in a good way on the first Linux machine. So 43.5, that's pretty bad. Um, it's bad enough to throw our hypothesis out the window, certainly. So at this point, we're kind of shocked by our results. We weren't expecting it to be this way, like I said. Um, the next thing that goes through our mind is why? Why do we see this? Um, and the, the two things that come to mind are, well, just-in-time compilers and garbage collectors. That seems like an, an obvious thing to pursue next. So what we did was we went back and instrumented two of our VMs to give us information about how long they were spending in just-in-time compilation and GC. A couple of examples. This is faster running on PyPy on a Linux machine. The bottom plot is just the run sequence plot. You've seen those before. The plots above are showing the time spent in the just-in-time compiler and the time spent in GC. Now, if we look at this one, we see that it's been classified as no steady state because there is a late change point. Um, and also, all of the, um, the phases, if you like, are on a very gradual incline. It's quite hard to see on this plot, but it's there. Um, if we look at the time spent in the just-in-time compiler, nothing surprises me here because the JIT was just busy in the early stages and then sat idle for the rest of the time. The GC plot, however, is more interesting because it's really tightly coupled with the wall clock time. And what that tells me is that all we've actually measured here is the GC. This benchmark is dominated by GC. And this turned out to be a bug in PyPy's GC. Here's another example. This was the Richards and Hotspot example I showed you earlier. Um, so we have that slowdown at iteration 200. Here, GC can't be blamed. We just see regular, um, regular collections. Nothing unusual there. The JIT graph shows, though, that the JIT was busy around iteration 200 suggesting that what happened here was that the just-in-time compiler emitted some new code which performs worse than the code it had before. So in some cases, we could tell what was going on. The sad truth is in many cases, drawing those, uh, those plots just couldn't tell us. So there's something else here that we don't understand. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to just wrap up and then we'll take questions. So what have we learned from this experiment? Firstly, that benchmarks often don't warm up as we expect. Secondly, if you repeat a benchmark, then you may not get the same warm-up characteristic. And this opens the question, have we been misled? Um, have we implemented optimizations which uh, either don't do anything or are actually bad because we were not able to benchmark accurately? Kind of an open question. Um, but what can we actually do about this? Well, we don't have any sort of like one solution to this. Uh, clearly, there's some things here that need more research. Um, however, we do have a few recommendations. 
Firstly, if you run your benchmarks for longer, you're more likely to uncover issues. So by just by running these things longer for 2,000 iterations, we saw things that people hadn't noticed before. Secondly, we have to accept that peak performance may not occur, and even steady state may not occur. Thirdly, we can't always blame GC or JIT compilation on the strangeness that we see. Fourthly, we should always report the warm-up time. It's, a, it's a, an important metric, I think. And finally, should we be engineering our VMs for more predictable performance so that we don't get into this case in the first place? And that's kind of a question to the audience. Um, just before we finish up, there will be one more version of this paper appearing on Archive. Um, it just uses a new version of Chrome, which has a more reliable way of collecting statistics. We don't expect the new version to change the conclusion of our paper. And I'm finishing up there, so thank you very much for listening, and I'll now take questions. <laughs>